So is everybody in Luke chapter 9? All right, so that's where we're going to be. But what are we talking about? We're talking about our seven stages of spiritual growth, right? And uh, we, we talked through stages one, two, three, four, five, and today is stage six. Now, I've been quizzing you every week, and this is what it sounds like when I quiz. Nobody's answering me, right? So what's the first stage of spiritual growth? Repent. Repent. Oh, see, that's what I've been looking for. Is that, that's what I've been looking for. The first stage of spiritual growth is, it is repentance. Now, how does that, really, okay, that has to do with your salvation, but it also has to do with the beginning stages of you just learning to follow Jesus, right? That's you saying, okay, I need Jesus Christ. I need him. I need him to save my soul. That's repentance, right? That you're turning away from your, from your wickedness. You're turning away from your false idols to serve the living and true God, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Right, so that's repentance, but it's also, hey, I'm seeing the word of God and my life's, my life's not lining up. Th- those are the times where, okay, you've been in church for a while and, and you've been hearing things, but you hear the gospel, you get saved, and then like the next few weeks, the guy up there preaching has been in your living room. The guy up there preaching has been in your car. How's he know what, what's, what's going on? How's he know? No, that's the spirit of God saying this applies to you. That's the spirit of God, and you're, you begin to repent in your life. I say, okay, my life's not lining up with the word of God, and you begin to change. You ever been there? Like, how does that guy know what's going on in my world? Uh, I don't have a clue. It's the word of God. Amen? It is the word of God. So that's the first stage is repentance. What's the second stage? Enlightenment. What does that mean? It's just knowing the Father. It's knowing, knowing God, right? We've, we've related these to children, but I kind of want to relate these to how these work through, through, the, through this church. And so enlightenment, that's your time of personal discipleship. That's where you say, okay, I've counted the cost of discipleship. I want to be a disciple. I don't, I don't want to just be a believer. I want to be a disciple. Now, I think in today's day and age, we've equated those two terms, and they are not the same. There are churches full of believers. They've genuinely accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But that doesn't mean they're following Jesus, right? They have believed in him. God has saved them. But God wants so much more. Right? He doesn't want to just save sinners. He wants surrendered saints. And so enlightenment says, okay, I want to get to know him even more. I'm holding this water, and I had to take a drink. I'm sorry. All right, so just enlightenment. Okay, I want to know him more. That's personal discipleship. That's walking through those four goals of discipleship. That's walking through those 18 lessons of discipleship. That's, that's enlightenment. That's personal discipleship. That's me wanting to know the Lord. That's, that's me sitting down with somebody or somebody sitting down with me and we're pouring over the pages of God's word. And th- by the end of that, I should be able to learn how to walk on my own, right? I should be able to study the word of God. I should be able to, to read the word of God on my own. I don't have to rely on somebody else to, to feed me. I can feed myself. Now, it's messy at times, right? You ever fed a little kid spaghetti for the first time? More is in their hair than it is in their mouth. And that's all right, and so it's cute. Now, it's not cute if you're 30 doing that, right? It's not cute if you're maturing in the Lord and doing that, but it's, it's cute at first. But, hey, you got to learn to get a lot more in there. Less on your hair, more in your mouth. It's a victory when you have spaghetti and they actually use the fork for the first time. Praise the name of Jesus. Well, that's, that's enlightenment. Third stage. What's the third stage? Yes. Ministry involvement. Okay, what's actively happening In the church, what ministries are already happening within the church? How do I get involved? How can I just come alongside somebody and say, hey, I want to learn from you. Can I help? I just want to be a part of what you're doing. That's ministry involvement. Now, the fourth goal of discipleship is ministry, right? The first goal is worship. We want to see you bow down before the Lord. Second goal of discipleship, we want to see you plugged in the Word of God. Not where you're just reading the Bible, but you're consistently meeting with Jesus through the Word of God. The third stage is that you're plugged into this church. You're, you're plugged into the local church, right? That you're, you're, you're submitted to the structure, and you're submitted to the vision. These are the directions we're going. The fourth goal is that you get involved in ministry. Now, we don't just plug anybody into ministry. No, we're going to see you disciple. We're going to see you grow. So the, that, that stage is ministry involvement. That's where you're participating actively in ministries that are already happening. And then for the fourth stage, what's the fourth stage? Leadership, what? Development. Key in on that because development and responsibility are two totally different things, right? So leadership, development, that's, that's discipleship too. That's you, uh, you begin to disciple somebody else, right? That you've been discipled. Now you take those same things that have been given you and you give it to somebody else. That's leadership development because we are always training leaders here, amen? 
We're always training leaders. We want to see you develop in leadership, not just come here, get a little Bible knowledge and sit in a pew. We don't want that. Right? Our goal is that we would train up believers to send them out and go plant other churches. That's our goal. That's what we want to do. Now, we're not far away from that, Lord willing, that that day could be happening within the next couple of years. How awesome would that be? That'd be pretty amazing. Well, we don't just grab somebody and say, go plant a church. No, we develop leaders, right? And so we develop leaders by seeing them actively. Can they lead somebody else one-on-one? If they can't do that, then they're not going to lead a church. Make sense? So we have to have leadership development. How are you making disciples? But also that's that de- discipleship too. Let's get a little bit deeper. Let's get into the deeper things of God. Do I understand the, the word of God that I have? Do I understand how I got it? Do I understand, have the character qualities of a man or woman of God? That's discipleship too. So last week, what's the fifth stage? The moment of crisis. And I'm telling you, that is the most important one. God is leading you to that moment, that moment of crisis where you say, okay, this is it. I'm all in. I'm all in. This is the point of no return. And unfortunately, a lot of believers get to that moment of crisis and they turn around and they walk away. They say it's too hard. And God will bring you to that moment. God will bring you to that point where you have the choice. Are you going to walk away or not? Because if you're going to walk away here, you don't even have a clue what's waiting you in the next few years. Right? Peter's going to say something here uh, today that is very, very true in what he says, but he has no perspective of what's really awaiting him in the next few years. Okay? So we're going to look at some of those things. So the fifth stage of discipleship is, or spiritual growth, is that moment of crisis where you get to that point of no return where you say, I'm all in. Where everything in you says, run. The faith in you says, I'm taking the next step. I'm trusting Jesus. And when you get to that point, God says, okay, now I can use you. Remember how we walked through all those examples in Scripture of people having that moment of crisis? All right, so here's the sixth stage. Here's today. is leadership responsibility. So leaders have been developed, they've gone through this moment of crisis, and then God's going to get you that leadership and responsibility. And I know what some of you are thinking, wait a second, I'm not even to that stage yet. So is this for me? No, there's some practical things for us today, all right? So as you're measuring, as you're seeing, where am I on this spiritual growth chart, right? Where am I? Okay, maybe I'm not to to stage six yet, but that's okay. You know where you're headed, amen? You know where you're going, so we're going to look at how Jesus interacts with his disciples. How does, he, how does he spend time with them? How is he training them? Well, there's this, definitely a time where he says, okay, I need you to pay attention here because my time here is very limited. And I've got a short amount of time, and everything from this point on is because you're getting ready to take the reins. And he says that twice to them. And we're going to look at, look at both of those times here in Luke chapter 9. So leadership responsibility. Here's how this That's LFBI. That's Living Faith Bible Institute. That's, that's say, okay, I'm going to take some responsibility here. I need to get some training. Right? We're not sending people off to, to seminary. No, we're going to train them up within the body of Christ, right? Now, from somebody getting saved to the moment they're leaving is going to take at least seven years, at least seven years to prepare them to get out of here. From, from the moment they're saved to the moment they're ready to go, this should be at least seven years, right, from being discipled and discipleship too and the shepherds or shepherd school, <laughs> that's the old school stuff, right? Living Faith Bible Institute and then actively involved in ministry. Are you leading a ministry? So leader, leadership uh, responsibility says, okay, there are active ministries. How can, I, how can I start a new one? Where I'm doing a Bible study in my home or I'm reaching my neighborhood for Christ or I'm doing this Bible study or I'm, I'm doing this ministry. Remember, ministry is not service. Service is mowing the lawn, shaking hands at the front door. Those are, we need all those things. I love walking into a clean building. Anybody else? Right? Um, I love that my son is responsible for making coffee every Sunday morning. I like that. I can just go downstairs and grab a cup of coffee. That service. Ministry is the word of God open. Ministry is the Bible open. You're giving it. You're feeding it to somebody else. That's ministry. Right? Now, I'm sure there's some overlap in those different things. So leadership responsibility is it's like an internship, isn't it? It's like an internship. Hey, let's you come alongside, once you just follow, once you just learn to lead, I'm going to make you responsible in some things because if you can't be responsible in the small things, you'll never be responsible in the big things. You ever told a kid that? If I can't trust you in the small things, I can't trust you in the big things. Well, that's the same thing in the church. We're always training leaders. All right, so once you go through this moment of crisis, you're going to make some decisions. I'm all in, this point of no return, 
Well, then God says, okay, you made some decisions. Now let's put you, give you some responsibility so you can make those decisions. That those decisions that you made, you can put them into action. Because decisions are meaningless if there's no action behind it. Truth? Am I the only one that gets that? Right? You can have a New Year's resolution, but if there's no action behind that New Year's resolution, there's no, there's no power in that decision. You can sing songs like I have decided to follow Jesus and there's no action behind that. You just, right? If, there, if there's no action behind the words and the decisions you make, then, then there's no power in that. And so that moment of crisis, God says, okay, now you've been through this, disciples. Now I'm going to give you some responsibility to put those decisions into practice, right? So when God brings you to that moment where it's sink or swim and you decide, okay, I'm all in, the God says, okay, now I can use you. That decision you made, let's put that into practice right here. That's ministry responsibility, right? So here's what I have decided to follow Jesus really means. It means I have decided to follow Jesus so I can see others follow Jesus too. So what are you doing? How's your life look right now? Who is serving Jesus because of you? Who's going to be in heaven because of you? Who's following the Lord right now because of you? That's what it really means to follow Jesus. Because to follow means to lead. Everybody with me? That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're, we're trying to train up the body of Christ. And so we don't have just a bunch of people sitting in pews. No, we're actively engaging. We're, we're spending time with one another. We're pouring the word of God into each other. We want to see others follow Jesus too. That's why we do what we do. That's what we want to be about. All right? So we're always training leaders. We never want to stop training leaders. And now listen, how do you learn to lead? By doing it, Right? You learn to lead. You do it by experience. That's how you learn to lead. Now, listen, this is important. Leaders have to lead or they aren't leaders, right? If I were to say, hey, raise your hand if you, if you think you're a leader within the church. Well, that's, I'm not going to do that. But if, if you did, okay, then are you leading? Don't call yourself a leader if you're not leading, if somebody's not following you, right? So Jesus pours into Peter, James, and John. That is, they're, they're part of the 12, but then the 12 are beginning to invest in the 70, Right, and then they're 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 investing in others, right? So this is how it should work in a youth group. You have junior high working, and junior high kids just don't have a brain. I love them, but they I love you, but uh, the exception to the rule. Yeah. Oh, you're in high school now. That's awesome. You're in high school, so you've graduated. You get a brain. That's awesome. So junior high kids, they just tend to like their brain just shuts off. It just doesn't work. And so, man, we have some great, great, uh, we have the Hollies, we have the Williams, we have the Wilsons, and they're pouring into our kids. And those junior high kids, man, let's just call it for what, they're immature, right? And the only way they're going to be mature is to have somebody pouring into them and be an example. And so the junior in high school comes to youth group and sees the seventh grader. It says, I'm so much more mature than that. Right? right? So much more mature than that. Well, let's, let's get the right attitude. How about I be a leader? Right? How about I, I show up? Yes, yes, I want to allow the youth leaders to invest in me, but I'm going to do whatever I can to invest in the younger group. Right? How could I pour into this person? Instead of them annoying me to no end, I can love on them to no end. Right? Because the end result is that one day they're going to be a junior. Ugh, I'm so much more mature than that seventh grader. Well, hold on a second. You were that seventh grader just a few years ago. How about now you pour into that, the other seventh grader just like they poured into you? Well, so, so that's a simple example of, man, that, that should be across the entire body of Christ, right? That should be across the entire church, right? That we, we should see, okay, I see where they are. How can I pour into them? And somebody else is looking at you going, okay, I see where they are. How can I pour into them and get us to that? Now, that requires that you interact. That requires that you have fellowship. That requires that you spend time with each other, right? All right, so Luke chapter 9. We've got to cover a lot of territories. We're going to look at a lot of passages. We're going to see how does Jesus disciple um, his disciples? How is he training his disciples to learn, to, to be able to lead? To, I cannot talk today. To be able to learn to lead. All right, so we're going we're gonna to walk through the book of Luke just real quick. We're going to look at a lot of scripture. 
And uh, we're going to have to move really quick. So you have to listen fast. That's how Mark Trotter puts it. All right, so Luke chapter 9, verse 37. Is everybody there? Say amen. You know what? Let's pray. I feel like I need to pray. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much um, for to be in this moment. Lord, to, to look firsthand at how you trained your disciples. Oh, Lord, that we have the uh, ability to look back at that and, and to, 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 to view that and, and put those things into practice just within our own ministries here. So, Lord, I pray that those lessons that these disciples learn, I pray that we will learn those same lessons, Lord, that we won't uh, look at this and say, well, that's for that person in the sixth stage. Lord, that we'll take these things and begin to put them in practice in our lives today. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, allow your word to have free course, and may our lives be changed because of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so Luke chapter 9, verse 37. Now, check this story out. Because we're going to look, and we're going to look at a lot of verses. How is Jesus preparing his disciples? Because time is short. All right. So verse thirty-seven, and it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, so they've been on this Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, they've seen Jesus. Remember, we've talked about that. They come down, from the hill, and things are different now. It's a new time. Things have changed in the ministry. So they come down, and middle of uh, it says. Uh, the most people met him, verse 38, and behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he's mine only child. Well, that wakes up Jesus, doesn't it? He's an only child, isn't he? God is always focused. Okay, he says, my only son. Well, what's wrong with your only son? Verse 39, and lo, a spirit taketh him. He understands this is a spiritual issue, not a physical issue. A spirit taketh him, and he suddenly cries. And it teareth him that he foameth and, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. My son is, is, is possessed. He's got an evil spirit inside of him and it's affecting him physically. And it's a spiritual issue, Jesus. I need you. I need you to help out. Well, why? Because I went to your disciples and they couldn't do a thing about it. Look what he says here in verse 40. And I besought the disciples to cast him out and they could not. Notice this. He goes to Jesus, but only after going to his followers first. Anybody understand how this went out? He goes to the disciples. The disciples can't do anything. They, they couldn't cast him out. Verse 41. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? In other words, I don't have a whole lot of time here. I can't be here all of the time. You are a faithless generation. Last, last part of verse 41. He says, bring thy son, what does it say? Hither. Hither. Jesus says, bring your kid to me. You know, that's the responsibility of every parent and every church. Bring the children to Jesus. Just bring them to Christ. Lay them at his feet. God, only you can do this. Only you can save. Only you can heal. Only you can, only you can mend. Verse 42, and as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down and tear him, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Yeah. yeah. All right, so listen. Here's, here's what they're learning. They're learning to lead people to Jesus, understanding their limitations, aren't they? So as you begin, as, as, as leaders begin to develop, as begin to have responsibility, they're learning that they are very limited in their abilities. That, that, that they have limitations. Let me just tell you, when you get into ministry, you realize your limitations real quick. You begin to recognize that you are very limited. You think you got it all figured out. And then you do it, and you realize, I'm very limited in my ability. I remember Dayton, my brother-in-law. He's not here, so I'm going to talk about him. He, was, he tells a story of when uh, he used to go to the racetrack all the time, um, Watched his dad race. Did he ever watch you race? So he watched you race. He's been to the races all the time. Now it's time for Dayton to race. And they're trying to give him all kinds of instruction. And it's going in one ear and out the other because he's thinking the, all, the entire way there, I'm going to show these old men how it's done. I've been to the races. I know how it's done. I've seen what to do. He jumps in the car and he got smoked. I mean, absolutely whipped. He realized... In those first two laps, he's very limited in his ability. Very limited. All right. So, men, the same thing in ministry. 
I mean, I, I look at others and I can see, okay, I see how they're doing it. Well, if I was leading, here's what I would do. And Well, if I was, well, this, this is what I would do. Okay, buddy, here's the reins. How did you do? I fell flat on my face. Well, okay, recognize your limitations. The disciples could not cast them out. Why? Because they weren't doing it in the name of Christ. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 says they were casting out devils in his name. No mention of that here. Jesus addresses the issue. It's a faithless generation. They were limited in their faith. You see that? So as you begin to get involved in ministry, as you begin to have responsibility, God's going to lead you through a moment of faith and recognizing your limitations, that you've got to lead people to Jesus, that you aren't the end-all, be-all, you aren't the solution to the problem. I got this. I'll fix this. No, you won't. Jesus will. Amen? So that's the first lesson. And now, so he allows that to happen. And the very next thing out of Jesus' mouth, pay attention to verse 43. All amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered every one at all things which Jesus did, he said unto who? Now, this is a special moment. This is a special teaching just for these guys, just these 12. Verse 44. Let these things sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. What's the, he says, okay, disciples, you need to understand, let these things sink down into your ears. Man, I remember my mom saying stuff to me like that. Let this soak in. Get it. Listen. Right? Let it sink down. Listen, I've got a short amount of time. He says, the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Verse 45. But they understood not the saying. Jesus kind of clears off his spot and says, hey, I'm, I'm teaching you. I'm, I'm preparing you. I'm, 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 I'm preparing my disciples because I'm going to be leaving soon. You need to be listening. You need to be paying attention to everything that's getting ready to come out of my mouth. Now, you've heard me say a lot of things, but now I really want you to be listening because time is short. Everybody understanding that there's been a change in the ministry? There's been a change in direction here? Jesus says, okay, these next few, these next few months are going to be crucial and critical in your life. And this is about six months transpires between Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 19. There's a lot of happening just in those, in those 10 chapters. All right? So look at verse 46. Then there arose. So it's like immediately right after that, right? Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest. Like you haven't got anything else to talk about. As you're walking along, well, which one's more important? Which one's the most important one here? Verse 47, and Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and said, he's getting ready to have an object lesson, isn't he? So they're talking, well, I saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, I walked on water. I'm more important. And Jesus says, let me just teach you something here. And he grabs a kid. You know what I love about Jesus? There's kids everywhere. Now, they're not mentioned a whole lot in Scripture. The children are everywhere. Praise God for our kids. Amen? Praise God for them. And the disciples were constantly over the children at all times. They're overlooking them. Get away. This is adult business. Well, he's, he grabs his kid puts him in the midst of him, verse 48, and he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Oh, you, you want to talk about who's the biggest and baddest? Who's the manager? Who's, who, who's the CEO? Who, who's, who's going to be the one in charge? Who's the greatest amongst you? And Jesus says, let me just tell you, you got your perspective messed up. See this kid? You ought to be focusing on the least. Right? You ought to be focusing on the overlooked. So here's the lesson they're learning in verses 46 to 48. They need to learn how to be humble, don't they? They need to have a slice of humble pie. And Jesus kind of crams it down their throat a little bit. He says, yes, you need to lead, but not to be looked at, but to see the overlooked. You get that? That's why we lead. We don't, we don't lead so that everybody's recognized, well, I'm pastor of this, or I'm leader of this. No one cares, man. Don't lead to be seen. Lead to see the overlooked. That's ministry. It requires you to be humble. Jesus is constantly touching the leper. Jesus is constantly going to the sinner. Jesus is constantly going to the, to the, to the, to the woman at the well. He's going to the people that no one wants to be around, no one wants to see. And no one wants to touch. And that's who he goes to. Maybe our ministry would be flipped up on side of its head if we would do that. Amen? Quit worrying about who's biggest and baddest, who's the best, 
and focus on who's missing Jesus here? How do I get them to follow Jesus too? All right, so that's happening here. Then, then look at here in verse 49. And John answered and said, Master. So he like changes the whole subject, right? Notice the last part of verse 48. The same, uh, so for he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Pew, pew. That saying did not sink down on the ears. John immediately says, verse 49, John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. We forbade him because he followed not with us. We told him, no, no, you don't do ministry because you're not doing it the way that we do it. You're not walking with us. You're not talking with us. You're not, you're not spending time with us, so you don't get to do ministry. And John, what does Jesus say in response? He says, and Jesus said unto them, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is what? For us. Are, are they doing it in the name of Christ? See, in leadership responsibility, we need to understand teamwork is vital. We need to understand the importance of teamwork. I know we know this. But can I just say this? We aren't the only church in town. Amen? Praise the Lord. That we're not the only church in town. Listen, I never say this right, so it's never going to come out right. But uh, every everybody needs a church but not every church is for everybody okay and so praise God that there's others preaching the gospel now there's some other churches in town that ain't preaching the gospel right they're not proclaiming the truth for sure but man there's some, there's some churches out there doing it we need to understand that we aren't the only game in town and you learn that by doing ministry Listen, this is very, very important. Never isolate yourself. Been there, done that. And what happens when those bridges burn? You burn down too. Don't isolate yourself. And also this, don't isolate somebody else. Well, we forbid them because they weren't with us. Did they do it in the name of Christ? Okay, then. Now, doctrine's an issue. Jesus doesn't address that. He says, they're not against us, they're for us. Forbid them not. Verse 51. Now check this out. Verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. So Jesus is, I mean, the time is short. He's about ready to be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Ready for a Bible study moment? Why does he go to Jerusalem? Why is he steadfastly setting his face to Jerusalem? Luke chapter, Luke chapter 18, he's going to present himself as king. Right? He's going to be walking on the foal of an ass. Or he's, he's going to be riding on the foal of an ass. Right? He's going to be walking in the, and they're going to be waving their palm branches. Hosanna, Hosanna. He's on his way to present himself as king, but he's also on his way to present himself as the lamb. Remember what we talked about that last week? God will provide himself a lamb. Here's it. He steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem to present himself as king, present himself as lamb. So he's on his way to Jerusalem, verse 52, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the, what? The Samaritans, the half-breeds, the ones that the Jews had no dealings with. You think Jesus is trying to teach them something? You see, in John chapter 4, he says, I must needs go through Samaria. Right? I have to go to the unreached. So the Jews would go out of their way to avoid Samaria. They would just go out of their way. They would add hours and days to their trip just so they wouldn't have to talk to them. Just avoid them. We don't go to that neighborhood. We don't talk to those people. We don't, we don't like what they're about. And Jesus says, I'm going to send you before my, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, but I'm going to send some messengers in front of me. And they go into the village of the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans, they didn't like the Jews either. So the, 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 the hate went both ways, right? The prejudice went both ways. Verse 50, uh, uh, 53. So they get to the, the village of Samaritans to make ready for him. Verse 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Oh, you just want to go through our country. You're not really interested in us. You just want to go. No, I'm interested in you. I wouldn't come through your country. So they wouldn't receive Jesus. Why? Because their prejudice got in the way. Verse 54. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord. All right, so Stop. Don't, don't read anymore. Stop reading. Don't cheat. Now listen. 
Now, what's your response going to be? If you walk up to the door, right? Let's go to this door right across the street. You go knock on the door. They say, sir, I'd love to, love to talk to you about Jesus. It would now be a good time. And then they give you the what for, right? So you're just wanting money. money. You're just wanting this or what's your agenda. And they slam the door in your face. I mean, you're going to be a little perturbed, right? You're going to be a little upset. But they didn't reject you. They rejected Jesus. And what's your response going to be? A good biblical holy response is, Lord, soften their heart. Prepare them for the next conversation. Your flesh is going to say, I'm going to the next door. That's what your flesh says. You know what, you know what these guys say? Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did? We'll, we'll turn them into shish kebabs right here, right now. Oh, they want hell? Let's give it to them. That's what they, that, that's the response. Holy guacamole, Batman. Check this out. In verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elisha did? What? Their prejudice gets in the way. They, they don't, they're not there for souls. Their, their passion is not about souls. Oh, my goodness. I can't even imagine this. Verse 55. Can you imagine? You ever got the stink eye from your mom or dad? Can you imagine the stink eye they get from Jesus here? And he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to what? Save them. And they went to another village. Oh, they're not going to hear you here? Then you go to another village. Listen, what are they learning here? They're learning to love all people to salvation. Did you get that? What kind of people? All people. All right. How many of you have been paying attention to the news? What, what happened to Virginia the last two days? Anybody hear about this? A group of men wearing their swastikas and their neo-Nazi alt-right stuff, and they've got their, they got their tiki torches. I mean, because they're big and bad, they went to Walmart and bought a tiki torch. And they're doing their Aryan Nation stuff, and they're calling themselves Christians. Anti-Hispanic, anti-black, anti-Jew, anti-everything. Guess what happened yesterday? Somebody died. And you're claiming Christ? Do you understand who's going to be in heaven with you? Who's going to be singing those same songs? Every tribe, every kindred, every nation, every tongue. You know what Jesus is telling them? Check your race and your politics at the cross. We're reaching people for, the, for Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, a lot of leaders, you gotta, you, you'll grow through this issue. Because you'll find prejudices you didn't know you had prejudice. You'll find some political issues you didn't realize were an issue. And you have to wade through them to minister to the least of these. I'm just telling you. And unfortunately, there's a lot of leaders that can't figure this out. You want us to call fire down from heaven? Jesus says, man, I'm in the saving business, man. I just want to leave. I want people to be saved. I want people to be saved. Look over here in chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now notice this, and it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Their leader was praying. What are they doing while he's praying? They're watching him pray. And Jesus just keeps praying. And finally they realize, 
I wonder if there's a connection between ministry having success and prayer. And they're starting to put these two things together. And they see Jesus get up from prayer and they said, can you teach us to do that? I want to have bold access to the throne room of God. I want to, I want to be able to, to pray. I want, to, I, want to, I, want to, I want to usher myself into the presence of God. And he lays out the, the Our Fathers, right? Which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He says, this is the model prayer. You go up and then you go down and then you go out with your prayers, right? And so what are they learning here? Well, prayer, the importance of prayer. But here's something else I want you to get out of here. The prayers of a leader reveals the heart of a leader. The prayer of a leader reveals the heart of a leader. And if you're not willing to pray, you're not willing to lead. That's just reality. If you're not going to show up to prayer, if you're not going to pray, then don't, you're not lead, that, that reveals your heart. Right, so every Wednesday we meet in my house to pray. You, want, you need to be there. The heart of a leader prays. Amen? All right, so look at chapter 12. Chapter, man, we are out of stinking time. All right, chapter 12. Look at chapter 12, verse 22. I got a lot more to go. Oof, we're just not going to get there. All right, so look at chapter 12, verse 22. This is important. And he said it to his disciples. Pay attention to that. As you're reading through the Gospels, yeah, you have the red letters and you have the things that he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, but pay attention to where he's talking to his disciples because that's what he really wants you to get. Verse 22. And he said it to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than raiment, and the body is, 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 is sorry, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. So, hey, quit worrying about what's going in your belly. Quit worrying what's going on your outside. And how about we focus on the kingdom of God? How about that? Verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's focusing on the kingdom, not the kingdom of thingdom, right? Look what he says here in verse 33. Sell that you have, give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupteth. In other words, focus on eternal things, not temporary things. Verse 34, you ready for this? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You ever heard that verse? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Listen, leaders, they need to learn to prioritize eternity things over temporary things. The kingdom of God versus the kingdom of thingdom. Which is it? And let me just tell you, a lot of leaders stress about money. They stress about clothes. They stress about this. They stress about all kinds of different things. And God says, I need you to focus on the kingdom of God. And when you focus on the kingdom of God, I want to focus on your needs. I got you covered, man. But then he gives them something to do, verse 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You want to do a heart check real quick? Open up your checkbook. Your checkbook always reveals your heart. Here he goes. He's talking about money. I'm not talking about I'm just talking. You want to do a heart check? Go find out what you spend your money on. Just go check out what you spend your money on. You'll find out what has your heart. Some of you, it's eating out. Some of you, it's clothes. Some of you, it's cars. Some of you, it's, it's your toys. Some of you, it's missions. You know, what, what, what has your heart? Well, there it is. Focus on the kingdom of God. Now check this out. Verse 18. Sorry, chapter 18. Chapter 18. Chapter 18 and verse 28. I want you to pay attention to what Peter says here. Chapter 18, verse 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Is that true? Peter's telling Jesus, Hey, I've left everything and I've followed you. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Peter says, I've sacrificed everything for you. I've left it all. I've left behind the business. I left it all for you. And Jesus, verse 29, Verily I say unto you, there's no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, uh, world to come life everlasting. He says, yes. He, he doesn't rebuke him. He says, yes, you have left everything, Peter. You have sacrificed. Um, to 
may, yes, you will be rewarded for those things, Peter. But what's interesting to me is in John chapter 21, Peter has to learn another lesson, doesn't he? Hey, hey, Peter, you're going to be carried some places that you don't want to go. Hey, hey, Peter, you're on trial. Hey, Peter, you're going to die for this. That's the issue. Here's here's the lesson that you're learning. Sometimes I feel in leadership and and positions of ministry, we get to sacrifice everything we can sacrifice. And we think that we've given it all. And Jesus says, yes, you have given it all. But there's going to be a, there's going to be a time where you're going to give everything. And true leadership says, I'm willing to lay down my life. I'm willing to put it all down because he's worth it. Because he's worth it. He means it. He means it exactly what he says. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He says, yes, you're right. But notice what he says at the end of this, and we'll be done. Verse 31. Then he took unto him the what? The 12, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. He, this is now the second time he's told them, isn't it? First time, hey, you need to be listening because I'm getting ready to be betrayed. You need to be, let these sayings sink down in your ears. Time's short. Time's really short now. He says, hey, hey it's, it's getting ready to happen. When we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be taken from you. In John chapter 17, we're not going to go there. In John chapter 17, he says, I've finished the work. I've, I've been, I manifested my, thy name and, and to my disciples. And then on the cross... What does he say? It is, it's finished. After he takes the drink, the vinegar, it's finished. He finished two works. He poured himself into the disciples and he also poured himself out for you and I. That's what Jesus Christ has done. And so our vision here as a church is to bring and build. Right? I, I, I look at this and Man, there was so much more I wanted to talk about. We just don't have time. But I, I look at this and go, okay, we need to be training leaders. And to, for that to happen, we need to be a going church. That means we have to go where the people are, but not just go, but go with the intention of bringing a harvest, right? It's what we're called Harvest Baptist Church. We want to reap a harvest. But what do you do with the harvest? You don't just let it sit there. No, you, you use it, don't you? So you bring a harvest, and then you put that harvest to work, don't you? And then that's the, that's the building part. We want to train disciples. We don't want to just have a church full of believers. No, we want disciples. Those are going to follow Jesus with everything they've got. The intention, if I'm following, that means I'm also, I'm also leading. I'm pouring into somebody else. Because eventually our goal is to, to grab 10, 20, 30 of us and say, okay, are you willing to sell the house? Are you willing to quit the job? Are you willing to lay it all down? And are you willing to move to another town and plant another church? Because that's true sacrifice. That's true saying, you know what? It's so worth it. Souls are worth it that I'm willing to cash it all in here to move there and submit unto another pastor and plant another church. Not just a church full of believers, no, a church full of disciples that are going to have the exact same vision, do the same thing here. Let's be a going, building church. Amen? Let's stand together.